Aperture. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Emily Stewart Hahn. I'm the manager of education and public programs at Aperture. For those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, it was founded in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators as a common ground for photography. Aperture today is a multi-platform publisher that unites the photography community in print, in person, and online. Um, before we begin tonight's program, I do want to acknowledge the tragedy and suffering that is taking place in Ukraine right now, um, and our thoughts are with the people in Ukraine and those affected. Uh, tonight's event is co-presented by Aperture and the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. We are thrilled to be joined by Jesse Alamon, Ken Gonzalez Day, Perla De Leon, and Sofia Cordova for the final event in our online series of programs celebrating the winter issue of Aperture Magazine, Latinx. I want to thank our panelists tonight for joining us, as well as Pilar Tompkins Rivas, Chief Curator and Deputy Director of Curatorial and Collections at the Lucas Museum, and the guest editor of the Latinx issue of Aperture. I also want to give a huge thanks to Amanda Hunt, Director of Public Programs, and Adriana Writings, Pro Project Coordinator at the Lucas Museum. As mentioned earlier, tonight's program wraps up our online series of conversations celebrating the Latinx issue of Aperture which highlights the dynamic visions of Latinx photography throughout the United States. This issue spans a century of image making, connecting historical and contemporary photography and covering the themes of political resistance, family and community, fashion and culture, and the complexity of identity in American life. Tonight's conversation will be moderated by Jesse Alamon, whose writing appears in the issue alongside an interview with Ken Gonzalez Day. Jesse is a professor of English at the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, where he teaches 19th century American and US Latinx literary and cultural histories. Aperture is a not-for-profit publication and crucial support is provided by the Kanakia Foundation, by John Stryker and Solovan Randolovich, and by Thomas and Susan Dunn. Lead support for the Latinx issue is provided by the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation. Further generous support is provided by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council on the Arts with support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature. But the easiest way to support Aperture is by subscribing to our magazine. Uh, subscribers are what keep the magazine going. Uh, you can subscribe on aperture.org. Uh, please be sure to submit any questions you may have uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening. Closed captioning for tonight's program is available in both English and Spanish, which you can access via the links in the chat. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Pilar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. And good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you here tonight. And thank you for joining us for this joint program between Aperture and the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. I wanna start by acknowledging and thanking everyone who's made this event possible, including my Michael Famighetti, Brendan Emser, and Emily Stewart Hahn from Aperture. From the Lucas Museum, I wanna thank Amanda Hunt and Adriana Writings for co-organizing the program. And thank you so much to tonight's speakers, moderator Jesse Aleman, who graciously agreed to be a contributor to the issue, as well as the featured artists you will hear from tonight, Ken Gonzalez Day, Perla de Leon, and Sofia Cordova. I wanted to kick us off by talking a bit about narrative photography and the archive and how that connects to the Latinx aperture issue, as well as our work at the Lucas Museum. First, I'm very honored to have been invited to guest edit Aperture's first issue on Latinx photography, the first of many, I hope. Equally, I am honored to have the opportunity to contribute to the development and launch of the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art an institution forging new connections within art and aiming to reach broad audiences through the power of narrative. Like many other institutions in the past that have been born out of a desire to talk about the history of art and culture in new ways, the Lucas Museum also seeks to shift the way that we think about images in the world. In this way, the museum's focus is on narrative art, emphasizing the stories that art can tell us as well as thinking through the impact that images, often those that circulate broadly within society have upon us. Now, when I began working on the aperture issue, 
I started by connecting my personal narrative to the idea of a history of Latinx images, which I write about in the introduction of the issue. I thought first of family photographs and their place within the archive of Latinx imagery. My own family stories and photographs are merely a drop within a vast arc of narratives that comprise the Latinx archive, which still needs attention and consideration on every level. Latinos in the US continue to be vastly underrepresented in art history, museums, institutions, and within broad mainstream avenues of culture, such as film and television. Where do you see Latinos and their stories? It's a question that continues to give me pause because impactful levels of representation within the spaces of culture and history are still limited. But I'm optimistic about the growth of that space through our collective action. I really believe that in order to understand the society we live in, we have to see the experiences and stories of the people that comprise that society. And this magazine is just one of multiple possible entry points into seeing and reading more of those narratives. And so thinking through narratives in relation to the photographers who are with us tonight will be part of what we explore this evening. But I'm also thrilled to hear what new directions and questions that this amazing group of speakers will posit for us to consider. Uh, and before I turn over the mic, I also wanted to highlight some of the images worth scrolling through as well. Not all of them appear in the magazine, but they are recent acquisitions for the Lucas Museum. We see images by Perla de Leon, who will be speaking tonight. Additionally, the museum acquired the Frank Espada Photographic Collection, an archive containing roughly 1,000 prints, negatives, contact sheets, proofs, oral history recordings, and ephemera related to Espada's projects, including the Puerto Rican Diaspora Project. And we also see striking images from the 1960s and 1970s by George Rodriguez, as well as Herman Maristani. I am so excited to hear what will unfold tonight. And let me turn this over to Jessa Aleman and to the guests for the program. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar, and good evening, folks. Um, I am Dr. Jesse Aleman. I am a professor of English at the University of New Mexico. Um, I am also a scholar and teacher of 19th century American and uh, US Latino and Latina literary and cultural histories. Um, I'm honored to moderate tonight's conversation on the narrative arc of Latinx uh, photography. Um, as has already been said, uh, we have many folks to thank for this event, um, including the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art, um, Aperture and its staff, especially Emily Stewart Hahn, who has pulled us together via Zoom, um, Boom, and email through the through the through, through really the strength of the internet, um, and of course Pilar Tompkin um, Rivas as well for curating um, the issue on Latinx photography and bringing me on board somewhat mysteriously um, on the one hand and yet on the other very appropriately to interview um, initially for um, the uh, special issue to interview Ken Gonzalez Day. I am neither an artist um, nor a scholar of photography, but in my research on 19th century Latino and uh, Latina people, I very often come across family papers and library archives with photos, daguerreotypes, um, portraits, um, carte de vistas, and other ephemera of visual culture that seem to tell a parallel story of Latinx history than the one I'm researching in letters and unpublished writings. Here we find Latinx people standing in dignified portraits, upper class profiles, unabashed mugshots, and ethnographic poses for clearly an Anglo-American photographic gaze. Always there seems something strange about these pictures to me, something haunting about their frozen moments in time and something also left unsaid, as if each photo captures its subject mid-sentence, as it were, right in the middle of telling a story about something that couldn't get captured in the frame, but nonetheless remains hanging there in the picture on the cusp of modernity. These are what we might call the embedded stories of Latinx photography and visual art. And tonight we've brought together three of our brilliant artists to fill out that narrative arc for us. 
the storyline details, as it were, of Latinx photography, its past, its present, and perhaps even its future directions. We are gonna encounter, for example, the historical archive. We are gonna encounter the urban archive, and we're gonna encounter what might best be characterized as the speculative archive, ways for us to try to understand what are the stories that our visual art and photography tell about the lives, tragedies, successes, resilience, resistance, and revolutionary nature of Latinx people in the United States. Um, so without further ado, what I wanna do is introduce our three artists in the order in which we are gonna um, ask them to talk a little bit about their work and the order in which we're gonna encounter them. Um, first is Ken Gonzalez Day. Um, Ken was born in Santa Clara, California in 1964 and his interdisciplinary and conceptually grounded projects consider the history of photography, the construction of race and the limits of representational systems from lynching photography to museum displays. Gonzalez Day's work has been exhibited internationally and is in the permanent collections of the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles County Museum of Arts, um, the Echo de Bauza in Paris, National Portrait Gallery, and Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC, among other institutions. His monographs include Lynching in the West, 1850 to 1935, um, a groundbreaking piece, by the way, uh, that combines narrative, history, and, uh, the, um, and art analysis, and profiled in 2001. He holds the Fletcher Jones Chair in Art and is a professor of art at Scripps College in Claremont, California, and he is represented by um, Luis de Jesus in Los Angeles. After Ken will be Perla de Leon, who was born in New York in 1952 and taught photography and video production in New York City to junior high, high school, and college students before working as a technology teacher slash trainer for the Board of Education, where she also produced instructional video shorts. De Leon has freelanced in video and independent film productions and produced Latin American photography exhibitions. Her work has been exhibited internationally and included in a variety of publications. Um, her current ongoing projects include Decades Under Fire, The Invisible Puerto Rican American, uh, Chapel of Gratitude, an installation on slavery in New York, and projects that celebrate the United Nations' International Decade for People of African Descent 2014 to 2024. And finally, we'll hear from Sofia Cordova, born in Carolina, um, Puerto Rico in 1985. Sofia's, um, Sofia makes work that considers sci-fi as alternative history, dance music's liberatory potential, colonial contamination, mutation as an evolutionary force, climate change and migration, and recently revolution within the matrix of class, gender, and race, um, and late capitalism and its technologies as well. She works in video, performance, photography, sculpture and installation, and sound. And I believe she also has dabbled in taxidermy too, by the way. Um, uh, so totally multimedia here. Um, she is one half of the music duo Chucha Santa Maria with Matthew Gonzalez Kirkland. Um, in addition to discrete projects, they collectively score all of Cordova's video and performance work. Cordova is the recipient of the Creative Work Fund grant and her work is in the permanent collections of Pier 24 Photography um, in San Francisco and um, CADIST, also a contemporary art organization located in the city. Um, with that, we're very, very um, thankful to have our artists join us today. And we're going to begin with Ken's work um, uh, here. And Ken, we're going to ask you to lead us off by talking a little bit about the narrative arc of Latinx photography in the archive. This is the subject of our interview in the Latinx issue. And I'm wondering if you could tell us the stories you've un uncovered in your work with early Latinx photography. Great, well, thank you so much for uh, having me, of course. And uh, we're gonna give short presentations. So obviously this is just gonna be a selection of three images from a much larger grouping. And the image you're looking at here is one of the sort of earliest celebrations of Mexican Independence Day. 
in downtown Los Angeles. It was photographed in the uh, studios that were basically near the first hotel Pico House in downtown LA. And it, it uh, came to me through Darlene Bailey, who's the, uh, the granddaughter of one of these uh, uh, young women. And uh, in a nutshell, her story uh, reflects all of our stories in the sense of thinking about the photographic archive beginning right uh, with an image that's found somewhere that we that we come into through our families and that we don't know who they, the individuals are. We don't know the histories and this idea of recovery. So I think the, the narrative that we see is both the, the, the stages of a photographic narrative for the archive would be, you know, finding the image, researching the image, and then like in this case, then presenting the image to a larger audience and then allowing others to connect to that image so that, that this becomes a, a larger representation of Latinx culture, even though it's of course uh, also somebody's grandmother. And so, and, um, and the question that, that she had for me was, what do I do with this image? I, I found this image and I, I don't know what to do with it. And so I, I tried to suggest a number of places to uh, donate it, to give it to, and nobody really would take it. So in the end, I was invited by uh, Aperture to make a selection from my collection of images that are both mine and things I've found in archives and elsewhere as a way of reflecting, I guess, the, the long 19th century, the sort of early images of Latinos in, uh, in the US and particularly in the West. So <clears throat> that's how the project started for me. Um, my larger um, project, and I guess we can go to the next image here very quickly. Well, maybe not quickly. It looks like it's dragging a little. <laughs> Or is that just my screen? There you go. So from the 19th century, this idea of sort of uh, uh, these early archives to really the beginnings of pop culture and the sort of distribution of images of Latinos, in this case, a sort of sexualized image of a Latino with uh, two uh, what look like toy guns and a sombrero sort of inhabiting the, the fantasy of the bandido, which is something, a legacy that we continue to um, live with and uh, and within and around and so uh, it seemed like that fit in with this overall idea of of where we find images this and the use of instrumental images meaning the use of images for ids for uh, family photos vernacular photos and really things outside of what i think of as fine art photography and then let's just go to the last one and then that way i cover all the images and then i have a minute to just talk we're supposed to stick to five minutes. If, uh, and so that's, I'm at, I actually put a timer on. I got uh, one minute left <laughs> to, to summarize 20 years of work. Um, but in a, in a nutshell, this last one is one of my own works where I've taken an archival image, in this case of four individuals being uh, lynched in the West. Um, my research has focused on the, the <clears throat> racial violence against Latinos in the United States. And I've been able to document over 350 cases of lynching in the state of California and basically changed our understanding of racialized violence in America, which has excluded Latinos uh, in the past and in the present. And so I, I struggle to find a way to make that erasure visible to Americans today so they could understand the complexity of American identity and the reality of racialized violence in our nation. So in this series, I take the bodies and remove them as a way of trying to make our historical absence present to make it visible to think about the narrative so the narrative arc of the photograph is from basically from the archive to the research to a presentation mode and then ultimately the hope is to changing a discourse and to engaging others in uh in a more complex understanding of culture and that brings me pretty much to the end so uh we'll talk more about it as we go but basically the archive that, that you'll find in the magazine comes out of research that was developed in building a number of different projects. And I look forward to talking about that later. Thank you, Ken. Um, you know, it's not that often that we think of an archive as an actual place. Um, but in, in Perla's case, um, your photography, Perla, has served to archive place. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how your work has, has served and set out to capture the narrative arc um, of historical trauma and historical change of very specific um, places. Thank you. Um, Ken, I first 
needed to quickly say how happy I am to see uh, both your first image because when I did my master's in photography, the conversation was always that uh, Latin American photography was too documentary and too political and wasn't artwork. And that that first image was amazing. And also because I actually did work on the lynching memorial in Alabama. So I wanted to add to it um, the lynching that of Native Americans and Mexican Americans. So at some point we'll talk on that. But uh, yeah, Jesse, uh, when I first started to, to do photography, I managed to uh, be one of the artists under the CEDAR grant in New York City, a Comprehensive um, Employment Act, I think it was called. And I was placed in, if you see the left uh, side there, there's a, what would have been a red building is at school. And I was uh, teaching pinhole photography to children at a time when the South Bronx had completely burned down already. And it was, it was only a, a couple of hours a week, but the stories the children would tell me, I really regret it not being a journalist because I, I wanted to document what they were telling me, uh, but I'm not a writer. And so I, I, whenever I wasn't teaching, I would walk around the neighborhood and interact with, um, with the children in uh, whatever they were doing, whether they were playing or on their way to school. And this is just a, a, a boy on his way to school saying, good morning, teacher. Um, and that's the background of pretty much every child that was in that neighborhood, which was, which was so sad. And yet the children were so lovely. Um, even if they told you that they went to bed with sneakers because their parents wouldn't let them go to bed without sneakers in case there was a middle of the night fire they could run, that used to break my heart. But, um, but like, like most children, any war that you see, children are gonna play, which is amazing. So I have this young man, and if, if you wanna go on to the next, um, this, this young lady, a lot of folks when the buildings would, would burn down, would look around to see if they could find um, any belongings or jewelry or anything because the fires were so quick and, and spread so widely. And you could see the three gentlemen in the back trying to do that. And this little girl just happened to be there. We didn't really have much of an exchange, but I thought she so much represented everyone there um, of you know what that community went, to, went through for so many, really for decades, but particularly the, the 70s. Um, and it's, it's very powerful. The, what, the only regret I have is back then, no one ever thought of, you know, give me your name and your address, which may have not worked anyway. How do you find these kids when they leave? Because I would love to now let her know that, you know, she's in magazines and in museums, permanent collections. <laughs> uh, but she absolutely, the children represented to me the struggle of that community. And the, the third one is, um, a, a young woman completely dressed up that even though the neighborhood is all burnt down, the pride in, in people there that no matter what little they had left, you were going to dress well, you were going to go to work. And if you were to erase the, the burned out buildings in the back, you would just think she's you know a typical New Yorker anywhere in New York. So to me, there was so much pride, whether it was the children or the adults. Um, in spite of the horrific, um, you know, situation that they were in, that hopefully when my book is published, I explain because a lot of it was said that you know there was a lot of fires by children, but um, in the book it explains how it was really done by think tanks who decided when the city was broke and was going to go bankrupt that they would just close all the firehouses in the poor areas, and almost all of them were in the South Bronx. Um, that's just a quick explanation of that. But um, my my goal was just how do I how do I cover any of this? Give it any kind of of a story visually, because I I thought it was you know just such an awful situation. Okay, I think my five minutes are up. <laughs> oh, and and there I I actually managed to play baseball with the kids after school. They were always watching me. Uh, walking around taking pictures and they would 
they would ask me to join them. So I'm a good player. So I would play baseball with them as well. <laughs> I'm sure it endeared, it endeared you considerably as well, if you can go out there and, and hit no, the stick. They, so. <laughs> well, the, the children would play hide and seek in those burned out buildings, which frightened me to death because I also climbed to the top of the roof. I could have fallen through the, through the roof. You weren't really supposed to go in them, but they weren't boarded up. And uh, so in it's a 64 images in the series, you know, and some of the perspectives you go like, oh my God, that's, that's, that's insane. But again, my, my concern was the children, you know, that why was no one coming in to do anything to help these children? Instead, we cut out all of the arts and music and um, sports. We cut out everything and this was the community that most needed it. Yeah. One of the things that I think is really interesting here is the way, you know, your photography can capture the narrative arc of the transformation of a very specific place and space. Um, you know, so we have one, you know, Ken talking about the narrative arc of the archive to the way your photography can capture the narrative arc of urbanization, displacement, right, and these strategies uh, um, that bear down on communities of color. Um, and then, you know, for our third artist, I think what's really interesting uh, about the way um, our third artist is, you know, au revoir has worked is in miniature, our third artist's entire au revoir of art captures the arc of photography. So, Sophia, if you could talk a little bit about both your recent work and then also sort of backfill a little bit about how we get to your recent work in relation to where you started as an artist. Great, thank you for that question. And thanks to everyone who put this together and everyone who's here with us. Um, because time in my work is more a suggestion than a fixed constraint, I'm going to actually work a little bit backwards. I'm gonna show this new work, which is the work that's featured in the issue. And then yes, answer your question because I think it's very, um, very timely and very useful way in. Um, so if you all out there in computer land will forgive me um, the formality of just sort of explaining this work um, ahead of showing you a quick excerpt. Um, this is the work that, um, again, is in the magazine and it's called Guillotina Wanna Cry Act Yellow Break Room, or in Spanish, Guillotina Wanna Cry Amarillo Sala de Descanso. And in brief, it's a performance and video work which has an original electronic score um, which swings between these sort of modalities of salsa and techno, all from um, samples. And the action that you'll see is set within a color-coded environment. And the work suggests, though importantly does not reveal, it, that it's a time and a place in a near future where there's an, uh, sorry, an ambiguous amalgam of ruptures. So global uprisings, destabilization of governance, um, and a series of climate-related events that have scrambled systems worldwide. Um, this work engages in conversation with historical revolution through the use of historical artifacts, such as documentary images, film, sound bites, and speeches, um, as well as found photographs. And these are pulled from archives that include the Black Panthers, the Sandinistas, the Russian Revolution, um, Paris Commune, the August Revolution in Vietnam, the 2009 protests in Puerto Rico, Chile, and Argentina but also looking at smaller acts of revolution, um, gatherings, meetings, protests, and short the labor um, of organizing. You'll quickly note that there are protagonists sort of speaking in an esprit de calier style on the left, and these people are channeling voices that range from poet theories like Fanon and Adrian Rich, um, and they sometimes speak like psychics in reality TV, so really creating a cloud of voices, um, kind of wrestling with these ideas of possible revolution. So. Emily, if you could please play the clip briefly, just so everyone knows, this is a 25 minute work that is here condensed to a very quick one minute clip, but hopefully it'll give you a sense of, of things. Esta That is, we want land, bread, housing, clothing, education, justice, we want peace, major political objectives, we want a black plebiscite, the UN, black colonial subjects would participate, dealing with, analyzing, 
projecting politically upon the racist atrocities that have been against black people in this nation. Great. And for me, getting to participate in this issue and be within the pages of Aperture um, was a gift in itself because my trajectory, as Jesse alluded to, begins with photography. Um, what I've studied ever, what the thing that I have any expertise in, like the thing that I can technically do in the world is photography. Everything else is pretty much something I've taught myself from that starting point. So briefly, I started really simply with the romance of portraiture. I loved going out into the world and making medium format black and white pictures of people. And it was as simple as that to me. As I started getting more engaged with theory and being sort of more disciplined in my practice, um, I started sort of developing a narrative around what it was to create that sort of work. Um, sorry, there's like a, I kind of, this is actually really perfect for me that it's this glitchy coming in, but hang in there. Um, so, you know, I started making four by five photographs and at the time it was all sort of very Dusseldorf Academy and these sort of beautifully formally composed images that I was sort of very good at emulating, but which to me felt literally too static. Um, so while I was in grad school, as tends to happen, I had this sort of paralysis and analysis and felt like this sort of static that was happening in the work felt related to my own unexplored subjectivities as a colonial subject, as someone from Puerto Rico who had moved to the States and felt that because of the trends in this medium at the time that there wasn't any room for that subjectivity. So I started working with music and performance and video as a way to initially really kind of in a, in a small scope talk about um, Caribbean diaspora as seen and sort of recorded through popular dance music. And this is how music starts to become really an important factor in my work. Um, shortly after that, I, as that project ends, I wanted to sort of expand the scope of the bodies that my work was talking about. And so I started working with science fiction specifically because it let me operate outside of the timelines that we are sort of beholden to and therefore the oppressive structures that we're beholden to. So I wasn't so much interested in apocalypse, I was interested in what happens on the other side and what that means and possibly could mean for the liberation of colonized subjects, black subjects, indigenous subjects, um, women, uh, queer folks, all of these bodies that are currently completely structured, structured and structured um, by capitalism and all of its machinations. And so once that work was finished, I felt like in a way I catapulted that work so far into the future that there was a need to kind of reel it back because sci-fi, what does what sci-fi does best is actually speak to the contemporary moment. Um, and so for me, the question of revolution feels very important right now. Um, and that's not to say that I have like a direct path towards that. In fact, my work asks the opposite. My work is so built with a plurality of voices um, that it's inviting this idea that this actually requires um, horizontal thinking and horizontal experiences. And so that is the way that I've come to this work where I am, yes, using portraiture, as you can see here, um, and choreography and sound, but also the archive starts to become a protagonist and perhaps an antagonist um, in this dance with if, if revolution is possible, how do we build it? How do we seed it? Um, and so I'm including all of these images that range from very kind of um, historicized revolution to smaller acts again of revolution, organizing, protest. Um, I tend to obscure faces both to dismantle the sort of great theory of like the kind of great man theory of, of revolution where we're like led by one person um, as well as also protecting protesters because that became an important discussion to have um, in how things were being documented in um, the uprisings of last summer or the summer before last. Um, and I do think that I am up on time. I do tend to ramble, so I will, I will quiet now. Thank you. We're, we're gonna come back to you, uh, Sophia, to be sure. Uh, you know, but because one of the things that your artwork does in particular is that it really sort of highlights the intersectionality, the crisscrossing of both multimedia, but also, um, you know, different historical and social pressures. And that really does lead me to, I think, one of the first questions I'd like to stage for you all. Um, you know, we're all featured in a special issue in Aperture that boldly pronounces in the front the Latinx issue. And, you know, I think it's, it, it, it sort of hedges its bet on the one hand and begs the question on the other uh, about this relatively new term um, 
uh, Latinx. And so one of the things I'm hoping you all can do is perhaps talk a little bit about what is or what does the X represent in your work? What is, what is the X cross out or what is the S X mark? Um, what is the who and what is being multiplied, um, for example, or who or what is intersecting um, in your work? So if we think about the X here as something that is operating as an artistic uh, unknown variable, I'd be really interested in hearing, you know, what does that X signify for you? And I want to start with Perla on this score because, you know, in a lot of ways, South, the, the South Bronx, you know, a sequence here was done, I think, late 79 or early 1980s. We were just starting the decade of the Hispanic, right? So Latinx was never, you know, that was Reagan's de de definition for it. Latinx was never on our radar there. And yet you're intersecting some really interesting things. So if you could talk a little bit first, you know, we'll start with you and then let folks jump in on what does the X, you know, represent in, in your photography? Well, it, it's interesting because photography, I rarely saw photography of any Latin American community. And if I did back then, it was Latin America. You didn't see much that, that nothing, almost nothing was exhibited from the States. Of course, I'm going back, way back. <laughs> um, so as, as the term Latinx starts to come in, at least when I became aware of it, um, I was slowly, especially having been a teacher for, for so long, um, feeling that it was going to finally embrace the Afro-Latino, um, obviously LGBT communities, but the Afro-Latino community was always a big concern for me because a lot of my students gravitated to African-American groups because they felt that they were excluded from the white Latino. And they were always that one group that didn't feel that they fit anywhere. Um, and women feel excluded in general anyway, but so, so if it was Afro-Latina, they, I always had a big concern that I, and I hoped that when that term came in, even though there's so many arguments over it, is that it really would start to embrace that a lot more. I mean, obviously embrace everyone, hopefully, but, but my experience was, was how much the Afro-Latino um, felt that they were neither white nor black and they weren't accepted anywhere. And, and, and that, that was always a, a, a big heartbreak for me to see young people feel you know, excluded. Yeah, that's a great way of thinking about how, you know, a, a very sort of specific group within Latino and Latina histories, cultures, and populations tends to get marked out um, in some ways, right? And we have to continue um, to sort of return back to, the, to you know, Afro-Latinidades as really instrumental into, you know, U.S. Latino and Latina histories. Sofia, you were going to jump in on that, and then we'll circle back around to Ken as well. Yeah, great. I really do want to jump in on that point specifically because it's actually a term that I don't readily use, um, whether it's Latinx or previous to its existence, Latina, Latino, Latine. Um, these are terminologies that I didn't readily that gravitate to for several reasons. One, I think that while it creates, I understand that it creates a very useful shorthand, especially from the geographic position of being within the United States, which I think is something really important to understand. It's a very of this geography term. It's unfortunately, I think, come to be used as a tool to create erasures of Black and Indigenous histories under this idea that we are all one and it's all very like jolly. But the reality is I have more in common with someone from IT than I do with someone from Argentina. And I think that these things are not fracturous, I think that these are things that make this a more interesting story. But it's just something that I want to preface because I think it's a term that is it is very fiery and it's sort of and it's sort of emergence because of these specific erasures and 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 histories, right? We're also banning under a, a tongue which is in and of itself a colonial tongue. Um, and these things are important, I think, um, to highlight. Like I said, it's also a, a kind of categorical denomination that feels like it's actually emerging from like a racial taxonomy within the US, which I just, I think is important um, to highlight. But I wanna also take this question, this sort of provocation of like, what is the X? And 
I don't know, I wanted to be a black hole. I wanted to be infinite. I wanted to be a place for things that I haven't imagined yet, that any of us haven't imagined yet. I wanted to be a place of possibility, a place of struggle, a place of encounter, a garbage can, a utopia. I wanted to be all of these things because I think that as we're emerging, as, as these terms are emerging, even in their clunkiness and even in how, again, I do think that there's a lot of problems with it. It's also, a, a, it signifies that there is an emergence or a desire to have conversations that bind us across things that we need to kind of band together around. And so for me, I, I hope that within its Xness, there is this provocation to consider fluidity in, in, in all its forms, gender, race, class, et cetera. Speaking of erasure, I mean, I think that, you know, in some ways that does mark to what gets X'd out in Ken's, you know, very early work on figuring out how to erase particular sites to sort of mark them. Uh, Ken, you want to jump in here and talk a little bit about the X in your work? Sure. Um, yeah, so part of that came from our discussion, right, with the interview, which people can read, of course, in the uh, issue. But um, I think for me, one of the things that, that was important or is useful is thinking as a, as a queer person, uh, it wasn't always easy to find a, a place within the traditional Chicano movement. And then as an artist born in the US, I uh, was often excluded from anything Latin American. So, uh, and someone with indigenous ancestors as well. So I, I was, I've, I guess I've, I've consistently been excluded <laughs> from all the different manifestations uh, up till now. And, and so for me, the X is a possibility of, of inclusion. I mean, and I guess for the future, the unknown, I know it's also very problematic. And I also think it's really interesting that it was embraced so quickly in the university system. And like my school had it, we had a, you know, it was already institutionalized so quickly that there wasn't very much consensus about whether you could actually say it in Spanish or whether, you know, all of these things about uh, how it functions. So, in a way, what's interesting is it becomes very, it seems at the moment, very American and really is talking about this space. So in that sense, as someone who's really of the Western part of the United States and intersects in numerous different sort of migratory movements, um, I find it as, a, as hopeful, I think. Um, so I, I think like all of us, we're trying to be a little bit hopeful about how it, what, what might happen with it. Of course, you never know, so anyway. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in a plug for that interview because you know part of the long conversation we had about it that kind of like your presentations got cropped down to four sentences, um, right? Part of that long conversation you mentioned as just sort of almost as a end point, you said something to the effect that well, if we just turn the X on its side, it's a plus. Um, and I really do find I really found that as a really nice way of thinking about how we're always going to keep adding to right that end of that end term there we're always going to keep diversifying that end term we're always going to just going to keep adding to um, that rather than subtracting we need no more subtractions uh, of ourselves and our people in history we just need to keep adding to right so I, I was taken back to rudimentary mathematics with you in that wonderful interview um, yeah, and, right. and, and, and you know that, that idea of you know turning the x into a plus I think leads us to what I hope to be um, our you know, final question before we open the space up for conversation. Um, all of you have been featured, highlighted, invited to museums and issues and you know, you're in the Smithsonian, et cetera, Perla. Like, you know, we're seeing this question here rise in, in front of us. Are we at a moment for you know, Latinx photography and Latinx visual art? Or are we seeing the start of a movement here in terms of understanding and advancing Latinx photography and, and visual art? I don't want us to be either or. I just want us to think a little bit about, you know, how do we understand this particular time right now? Is it a moment or is it a movement um, for some of our work? And Ken, I'm going to start with you because that question actually comes from some of the conversations um, that we've had um, prior to this meeting. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I first uh, came across that phrase. Uh, Thelma Golden was talking about sort of artists, uh, African American artists, uh, last year, two years ago, and sort of the movement around Black Lives Matter and uh, really museums and art institutions trying to take on and, and embrace uh, the, 
the experience of African Americans across the, in uh, many different facets of America at a very you know difficult time for the for the nation. And so uh, she was like, "This is a a, a move. I'm in a movement, not a moment. I don't know where you are." That was sort of her response. And I just I, I when you were we were uh, sort of talking, I just wasn't sure that we were in the same place culturally. I think that the question of whether there's a sort of an ability to come together for many different groups, if that's gonna materialize into something that really does change what we see in feature films, what we see in music, what we see in museums, what we see you know, in universities. Latinos make up less than 4% of professors, and yet we're about to become about 30% of the population. So um, it's, it's uh, frightening, the, <laughs> the lack of representation. In California, where we are you know, very close to a majority, uh, in many ways, and yet deeply underrepresented at all levels. Um, and and he, so the Latinx is also sort of a pacifier, I suppose, in some ways from from the revolution, right? That uh, that could that could happen. And so um, anyway, I think uh, I was to say it's an imaginary. That as we try to sort of construct this imaginary, how are we going to place that? And it's going to take a lot more than the four of us to make it a. <laughs> Movement. So, Sophia, I want to get to you on this score because you know much of the work that, that you have is also speculative about our survivals in the future and our resilience. So, talk a little bit about that. Are we, you know, heading up a moment, or are we stuck in a? I mean, heading up a movement, or are we stuck <laughs> in a moment? It's always scary to answer these questions and then you know have to answer for them later. Um, but I think I think to to Ken's point, I mean. I think that the, that we're in this really interesting place where I think this is actually a conversation that's happening across many kind of un, unpictured peoples is this idea of representation and is representation enough? And I do think that, yes, there is this like great upsurge of representation, but unlike say, and I'll, I'll give a plug to the magazine in this one, unlike say this magazine, which took this representation with such care um, and, and nuance about what this, again, the plus experience, or it's funny that math came up because I was sort of thinking of it like solve for X, like it's, it's always a moving target. So part of me worries that sometimes we're, we're too sated with representation um, and we don't push beyond what that means. And the institution is all too happy to have a stop at that rather than the conversation. Um, but where I do see possibility and, and hope not to like be a downer all the time is again, in like the way that the pages of this magazine brought all of these perspectives together, all of these, not just perspectives in the sort of simple imagistic term, but in the like very real ex felt and lived experience of all the people in the pages. I think that we start to open the door through the arts to then have this conversation, like I was saying earlier, across across class, across like, yes, visibility for, as again, to, to keep on piggybacking on Ken here, right? Visibility for Latinx people, as we think of it, is still actually pretty much in like the higher echelons of class. We're still not having these conversations of like, what is a factory worker at a chicken processing plant in Texas, like living, breathing, experiencing? Um, and so what my hope is that, through these modes of representation that we're all engaged in, we can then start to like really get to those questions, not just stop at, at being sated with representation on its face. Carla, how about you? Are you gonna, you gonna end us on an upper or are you gonna end us on a downer? No. A moment or movement? I'm older than all of you. So I, I, I keep feeling like it's a moment, but I'm also a very optimistic person. Um, in New York, we're seeing every single day a barrage of commercials with Asians and, and Blacks in every single commercial. And I'm like, okay, is this just for, the, for two months now? Or because we're in Black History Month or is this gonna move from there? So it's, it's really a hard, one, a hard one to talk about, but I am encouraged by how many curators I've met that are Latino and Black and people who really want to move our imagery in, in, you know, in different venues in different ways. I want to work with uh, Hunter College. They have a wonderful database of photographs there to try and get them into films. Um, most archives, when, when photographers, when filmmakers are using archives, they use a lot of the same archives. Mm -hmm. And why are we not using our own archives? You know, so there's, there's just many ways that, that each of us, I think, can do a little something 
And I, I think I'd love to see logos of Latin plus, <laughs> whoever wants to make one, I will, I will wear one. <laughs> Um, I'm okay with Latin X, you know, one way or the other, but Latin plus, I really like, <laughs> I think that would be so cool. But, you know, I think Ken has, has started a whole movement oh, on that, no, please. but you know, that one of the things that the plus also points to, uh, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about where this moment is moving towards, if we can combine both terms is, you know, the increasing, you know, democratization of technologies, the increasing access of different media to help create art, you know, um, a phone is in everyone's hand right now. And the, you know, the real question is, is that at, at what point does, you know, the visual through social media push and pull on, you know, the, the forms of art that are being circulated by our communities and by our people, um, you know, and, and I think those are really good ways of thinking about how just as those technologies continue to increase, as we see in the 19th century too, as photographic technologies increased and diversified, other things happened, right? You know, if, if at first we were being the object of representation, at some point, you know, we got our hands on a camera and became the subjects of representation. And I think that we could just keep thinking about that narrative arc throughout um, as, you know, key moments that hopefully produce movements, um, you know, in some capacity. Um, I believe we have some time for some questions and um, I am assuming those questions Questions are going to be sent in my direction um, by some of our crew here. And uh, if you have a question, post it in the Q&A. And then either, um, uh, I believe Emily will send it my way. OK, so um, one of the first questions is, is uh, reads this way. It's interesting that you brought up the issue of class. How can the narrative language you create with your art reach out to the academy, the gallery, the museum, and the archive, um, and more into um, the chicken processing plant? Um, so let's talk a little bit about you know that since you know first that was Sophia's point, and then we'll we can move around. Let's talk a little bit about sort of the way you know class and um, sort of these emergent you know forms of capital impact, discuss, or still marginalize you know, um, photographic um, representations? I mean, I think that there, again, is no easy answer there because we are deeply ensconced, right, within like a very specific system of making work and that work exists in specific venues that are not necessarily always accessible. Um, I do think that I think a lot about storytelling and it's in fact a word, it's, I'm curious, it's funny that it hasn't come up, right? We're talking about narrative and there is this weird like film between those two words, right? This, this like boundary between them. And it's a word that I used to really kind of resist, but I also think that it's a very obvious formula to any of us who've been on, on the underside of oppression, right? But it is the way it's kind of narrative and storytelling is like the battering ram through which we survive the like inhumanities that we are put through. And so it is my hope, it is my goal, I guess, within the work that in creating these insanely layered narratives that may feel in, in many ways absurdist, um, there creates like a slippage in hopefully the viewer to consider something completely absurd and 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 with and within those bounds yes like how do we organize and like move towards a future that is yet unwritten but also how to you know to kind of bring it to the space of art right since the question is very localized in that in that environment how do we invite folks into the institution and to see work and to be with work or to place the work in places that is more accessible through this act of storytelling. And again, it doesn't mean that it needs to be simple or unchallenging, but this idea of, of capturing something that we're already doing as communities, telling ourselves stories, right, to like narrate our histories. Um, and we do that in the family album. We do that in, in family photographs and videos and all the rest, which has come up for so many of us here. And so I think that image making also is particularly well situated for this, because as you're alluding to with talking about how the democratization of photography has led us to this specific moment, um, there's still a lot of room for that. Um, to always be a downer, I'm always worried about the way that these, these platforms are meant to distract us in very serious ways. Um, but I'm still really curious and still believe in the potency of image making, even in those channels, especially by young people who are still fresh and not downtrodden. <laughs> They're not, not, not downers. There's another question here uh, about, um, 
you know, photographers who inspire you. But before I get to that question, I, I wonder if Ken or Perla want to address, you know, the first issue just about class a little bit, or if you want me to move on to this second question. Um, when, when I came back from uh, photographing the lynching memorial, I remember spending months thinking, I can't do a photograph again that's going to go on a wall. And the only people that are going to see it are people that are already are educated and probably know the issues anyway. I felt like I needed to move into something else. And I wanted to go more into a general public. And so I'm doing a portable installation that moves through parks. <laughs> Haven't done it yet, it's, it's in the process, but that was my way of dealing with, I can't, I can't just do work for a certain class, you know, just for the educated or just for the, you know, the people who, who are fortunate enough that someone takes them to a museum. Um, so that's been my, my uh, way of, of dealing with it in the, last, uh, in the last year. And I'm working on also a project in Puerto Rico, the same thing, uh, working on some big projects that are all outdoors. It's the first time I'm gonna do that. I'm very excited about it and very overwhelmed because I, <laughs> you, you need a lot of other people to help you with something like that. It's, it's no longer I can take a picture. So yeah, so that's my class. That's my answer to class right there. Ken, did you wanna jump in there? Just a little bit. Uh, I mean, one of the things I'd say, yes, of course, we, we, have, we can move the art around, but the other thing is, we, do we want, there's two parts. One is, yes, we, uh, we want to uh, get the art into different spaces and accessible to other people. But the other thing is we want to elevate other people, allow other people to, not everybody wants to, you know, people want to own homes, people want to do things, they want to send their kids to college. So we also want to create pathways where we can bring, or at least bring other people along and empower other people and, and change the face of education. I mean, from my perspective, change the face of education from the classroom to the boardroom and, and really uh, see change happen in that way and allow other people to uh, find their way towards you know, whatever their dreams might be. And I think art has always been a way of re reflecting our best ideals. And I wouldn't hate to imagine a, a world without art. So I think, um, <clears throat> again, back to that imaginary, how do we see it, uh, having an imaginary as a, a place of power how do we see the creative output as something that em empowers us and empowers our community and not as something that's oppositional? I've had people, you know, give me the whole argument about art schools are bad and don't send their kids to college and all of that stuff. And I just, I can't go there. I don't, I don't believe that is the solution um, going backwards in time. I think it's how do we share resources? How do we distribute more resources? How do we create more opportunities for more people? And uh, I guess that would be my, my hope for what images can do. And, and I would just, one last little thing, I tell my students, you know, if we all took to our Instagram and our Facebook accounts and change the images today, we could really change the discourse. But so many people don't have a, a sense of what to do with their images, right? So, or how to make images that, and so we end up with images of cheeseburgers and people having a night out on the town and, and uh, things that don't empower us. So if we, if we recognize the power of those images, we could really change, our consciousness within a very short amount of time. That's a fantastic point, Ken. And you know, the, the next question in some ways, perhaps you can, you know, we can link the, that point with this next question. Cause it was also, this next question was on the tip of my tongue. Can you talk about the photographers who, who inspire you or whose work you're currently thinking about? And maybe we can even add a little bit to that to say, or whose work is doing the kind of work that Ken is mentioning right now. So, you know, that, that is empowering in some way. So. Can you know you all talk a little bit about some of the photographers whose work inspires you? <laughs> We're with them. They're, they're right here. <laughs> they're in the collection. Yes. <clears throat> uh, and somebody else since I just spoke. Sophia. Y'all don't put me on the spot. I'm so okay. bad at naming names. Whenever it's like when you get asked what your favorite song is, then it's there but you can't you can't summon it um Sophia, how about if you don't want to name names because i i see that that how how about what sorry. kind of work right like let's maybe we can flip this question a little bit um, that's you, so like, helpful thank yeah, you like what kind of work um i'm just gonna name you made me narrow it down and it's so beautiful and great so Las Nietas de Nono 
are this duo of artists um, that is operating out of Carolina, Puerto Rico, which is the town I'm from. So I'm very proud of them. Um, but basically, I'm going to quickly describe this work, but basically they created this beautiful multi-act play that happens in the house that they grew up in. And the invitation is for neighbors and the community to make this play. And it's these scenes of daily life, but they're completely fractured and glitch into one another. As you're traveling the house, there's no chronological order. And there's just something about it, which really, again, to Ken's point, isn't about you know, oh, let's make something that is like so inherently accessible that it has no teeth. No, it's actually like incredibly complicated and demands like a level of engagement that I think we're all capable of. And I think that that's one of the things that in, in restructuring this idea of reach, et cetera, is something that we need to think about. I would wager that like a hundred, let's say 99 to be fair, but like 99% of an audience is a sophisticated consumer culture because we're consuming it all the time. Um, even as we are kind of guided this way and that way, we know what we like and we know what we don't like. And I think that when we encounter a work that challenges us to, to meet those things and meet those preconceptions, um, I think that really powerful stuff can happen. And so I think that it is, as Ken says, it's like the, the role of these kind of uh, challenging works. Um, and I, I, do, I do agree with Perla too, I like the idea of putting it in place, right? Like we don't need to only show in these institutions, moreover, because that's not super exciting all the time also as artists, right? Like it's it's a hard idea to place work in the world. It's really pretty difficult. Um, but I think that that's maybe a beginning to these understandings of how to make work that is rigorous and disciplined and challenging, and also doing this other work of really engaging us with these larger conversations that we're all struggling with because the nature of our world is one where we're all in a struggle. You have a, a, a neighbor in Loisa, Daniel, I went blank on his last name. He's just had several exhibitions at the Whitney. Daniel Ramos Lind. Uh, all of his found objects, as someone who, was, who taught for so many years, I get so inspired by him because I like to show his work to young people and say, you know, don't always feel like, okay, I don't have this camera or I can't do, I can't do film yet or I can't do, and it, you know, to see what, what people can do with what's around them, what's considered garbage, what's considered, you know, this fell off the tree today, um, is so inspiring because it's very cultural, it's historical, it's, it's abstract. It's, I, I just really get inspired by his work. Um, and of course, many others, <laughs> I can't remember the name. Sorry, They're I said all... it wrong, but you're right. Daniel Lind Ramos. Yes, yes. I was They're all in the Latinx <laughs> special <laughs> issue. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So um, the, I have a specific question for Ken. Ken, speaking to Ken's archive, is the collection available online to um, see all the photographs? It's not. No. So basically, what the short version is, I started uh, doing research on Latinos in California between 1850 and 1900, because in all of the books ever published on photography, there are none looking at us. And I thought there must have been some amazing photos back then. Hello. So I started looking for them and researching and that led to the discovery of the, the history of lynching in California that became the subject of the book. And so I, I'm still collecting and researching and looking and, and, uh, and I often lecture in different places. So I was invited by Pilar to, to make a selection and, and shared a bunch, but I, uh, I haven't had a chance yet haven't been invited to publish them anywhere. So they sit in, in a box in my, in my garage and uh, I'm still trying to add more stuff and, and trying to create a context in which there, there could be a larger interest for them. So uh, somebody would have to, I can't do it all by myself, I guess is where we are. And that's the case for many artists. We have stuff we wanna share and we're just not able to do that just yet. So that's part of why something like this magazine is important, something why, why we all need to find ways to get access that the plus, how do we, Plus, you know, me plus you is plus something. And so how do we build on all of that is I think part of the challenge around visibility. And everybody has an archive of some kind. So what makes the collection I have any, any different than that? It, it, it isn't, uh, and yet it does exist and, and there's things to be found in it. And so I haven't found an audience yet for that specific work. 
And this last question, I think, is exceptionally relevant for you know the the field of artists that we have uh, with us today. Would you recommend, or could you recommend, any space in which a photographer can get guidance and mentorship focused on um, Latinx photography? It's a great question. I would say uh, through so. Look at your local community college. Look at the, I mean, there's definitely uh, photo institutes, ICP, uh, Anderson Ranch in Chicago, and uh, sorry, Aspen, that have like residencies and have a focus on these things. And you can look at those online. Otherwise, there's obviously going to be professors in local community colleges. Basically, it's getting access to where you're going to be around other students and get the feedback from each other. That's where the, the, the learning happens. So you can also access lots and lots of uh, historic artists through ICP, through lots of uh, photo collections and learn that way as well. And basically you have to, art is all about community. So find somebody that else that likes it and hang out with them and talk to them. And yes, one can take classes too, but you don't have to. And there's lots of also in Facebook, different groups. Um, so also Instagram, Latinx photo, <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of ways of finding people and uh, building networks that way. So I think now more than ever, there's ways to reach out and find people. Mm -hmm. Sophia. And, and I would say that something that is, uh, you know, to, to kind of give a little bit more power to, to like people power um, in this idea of community um, is that, you know, go whatever library is available to you that might have these repositories of, of art books. I know as a student, I, you know, I learned a great deal in the classroom, but a lot of my education happened in the library, just like living with these books. Um, I eventually became a book buyer. So like, that's a whole story, but that my real education happened in books. And what I want to say beyond that, right, because these books can be quite expensive and perhaps not accessible, is that once you like an artist and you like what they're doing, reach out to them. We're really like, I always say this to people because people can seem so far away and so distant, but they might not reply. They might be too busy. They might tell you, you know, I can't, but they might also really like what you're saying or really like your work or think that there's something there that they might be able to connect you with someone. And so it's a little bit daunting, but you know, know that most art, and I know this from writing people that I admire, people are really thrilled usually to get an email from someone. Cause you know, we all get a lot of emails, but not that many emails. So it's like a, it's a, it's a very nice thing to do. And it's also a really kind of easy way in. And again, it might be a dead end, but you kind of learn from those too. Hope that helps. Perla, did you want to jump in there? I, I agree, Sophia. I, I've mentored uh, young people quite often. Um, sometimes I've just run into them in a store and I, you know, I mentioned I'm a photographer and it's like, oh, I've been wanting to do this. And say, okay, here's my number. I, if I don't answer, it's not that I'm not going to, you know, but, uh, cause there's periods of time that, you know, you're a bit overwhelmed. I said, but I try my best to get back to them and, you know, I try and see their work. If they have a website or, or something and, and I find most artists do try and, and you know, get back to people who admire their work. Um, if I, I believe Strand Bookstore, which is where I got most of my books for years and years, um, probably has a great uh, website. I don't know because I haven't been to it in years, but it, I bought a zillion photography books there. If, uh, or you could just call them and say, what do you have? that is specific to, you know, uh, Latin American or, or Latinx or however you, you're gonna term it, um, photography, because they, they're, I think they're about the best bookstore there is when it comes to art. Thank you folks. And uh, with that, the hook of time has even ca captured me. Uh, Perla, it's, you know, unfathomable to think how many artists you probably um, inspired with your pinhole photography class in that burnt out building in the South Bronx. So don't underestimate your reach as well. And um, with that, I thank you all for joining us. And we have uh, Emily Stewart of Aperture closing out our session for us. So thank you all. Yes, thank you to everyone who um, tuned in this evening. Um, be sure to um, 
look on YouTube at our YouTube channel. You can catch the other two uh, talks um, that happened a few weeks ago. Um, thank you, Jesse, Ken, Sophia, Perla. It's been a real pleasure. Um, we'll have to celebrate when we're all together in person at some point on the same coast. Um, thank you, everyone. You can purchase your copy of Latinx by following the link in the chat. And also, you can read Jesse and Ken's um, piece from the issue on aperture.org, which I dropped in the chat earlier. Um, so thank you again. Thank you to the Lucas Museum for partnering with us this evening. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. And um, that's bye for now. <laughs> bye.